What day is it? It is Wednesday, my dudes. Ah, uh, yes. Hello, welcome back. Today is Wednesday, April 8th, and it is, drum roll please, day 10 of at home learning. So, let's talk about what is on our agenda for today. Today, we are going to review chapters one and two of Little Rock Girl 1957. We're going to read chapter three of Little Rock Girl 1957, and then you can choose whether to work on IXL, whether to work on your reading log, or whether you want to get started on that assessment for Little Rock Girl. So guys, I know I'm not giving you these like nice and tidy little packages of 30 minute activities each day. My approach is more that I'm giving you a variety of different options and opportunities and giving you lots of time to do them so that each day you have a little bit of choice and voice in what it is you focus on and work on. So previously on reading at home learning edition, we read chapters one and two of Little Rock Girl 1957. We talked about going into this, that we were looking at the writing style and the structure of the text and analyzing how the text is put together and why did our author Shelley Tugas choose to put the text together this way. Chapter one was a very straightforward narrative account of Elizabeth Eckford's first attempt to attend Little Rock Central High. Elizabeth just expected to be able to attend school that day like any other student. However, she and the other eight students who were hoping to integrate Little Rock Central High that day were met with angry mobs and their entry to the school was barred by the Arkansas National Guard who had been called out by Governor Orville Favis. The chapter more or less takes place only on that single morning, that first day of school. We end the chapter knowing a larger chain of events has been set off, but the narrative in chapter one focuses just on that day. In terms of analysis, we said that the reason Shelley Tugas chose to start the book this way is that it is easily the most intense and engaging scene in the entire text. And we know an author's job is to hook their audience's attention right off the bat. So had Shelley Tugas started by going through 100 years of history in a very dry and slow and monotonous way, chances are readers would not have continued to get to that point where we learn about the Little Rock Nine and their experiences. Chapter two, however, was a blend of informative and narrative writing styles. We began the chapter with some background information about the Jim Crow era and segregation practices in the South to kind of help build a historical context for us understanding the story that was unfolding in front of us, the story of the Little Rock Nine. About halfway through the chapter, Shelley Tugas brings us back to the story of the Little Rock Nine and their continued struggles to integrate Little Rock Central High School. With that change, we are also switching back to a more narrative style of writing. Through that narrative account, we learned that once they were able to integrate Little Rock Central High School, the Little Rock Nine were met with bullying and torment and even acts of violence and threats against their lives. Toward the end of the chapter, we learned that this conflict continued to escalate and it was really a power struggle between Arkansas Governor Orville Favis and President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, each feeling that he had the say in whether or not segregation practices ended. In a final move of desperation, Orville Favis, Arkansas's governor, closed not only Central High School, but all high schools in Little Rock. He closed all high schools for over a year just to stop desegregation truly unbelievable. At the end of the chapter, we get a little bit about how each of the Little Rock Nine finished up their schooling, and the chapter concludes by acknowledging how President Bill Clinton, during his governorship and presidency, honored the Little Rock Nine. So in terms of text structure, chapter one, straightforward narrative. Chapter two, a little bit of informative, a little bit of narrative. We posed the question before break, if this is really the story of the Little Rock Nine, where do we go from here? But I also pointed out in one of my previous vlogs that the subtitle of the book is How a Photograph Changed History. A photograph. Now, so far we've been focusing on the subject of the photograph, but what else could be involved in discussing a photograph? 
Well, photographs don't exist without photographers. Photographs don't get famous without being published. So my prediction is that in the later part of the book, we're going to look at maybe some of those aspects of the photograph itself. We'll see. As you get ready to read chapter three, please make sure you're previewing using text features. You can do that by opening the ebook, the PDF of the chapter, before you either read it that way or before you listen to the audiobook version that I created for you. I know it's been a while, so I'm gonna remind you those two questions that I want you to keep in mind as you read. The first question is, what style of writing am I reading? Is it narrative or informative? If you need some refreshers on how to determine the difference between the two, please check out the content that I posted the week before spring break. I will also include the types of writing PowerPoint with today's post, just so you can refresh yourself. The second question is, why is the chapter structured this way? And at this point in the book, we're not just looking at the chapter itself as an isolated entity. We are also looking, how does it help impact the book overall? And what does it do for you as a reader? So keep all those questions going in your mind as you read chapter three. We'll discuss them tomorrow. So I think it's just time for the wrap up. Is it time for the wrap up? Is that it? Is it time for the wrap up? I think it's time for the wrap up. So recap, if you are still getting caught up, you need to make sure to get caught up by reading chapters one and two of Little Rock Girl 1957. A reminder from my broad, do we call it a broadcast? I don't know, it feels pretty fancy. A reminder from yesterday's blog that there is an assessment that exists for those chapters. It is in the quizzes tab on Canvas. I will include it with every post this week. When is it due? That's right, next Thursday, April 16th. You'll wanna take that quiz and then you'll wanna order some takeout from Noodles and Company in Castleton to help support Northview Avid. Just a little shameless promotion. Anyway, the other thing you can be working on throughout the week is your IXL. I've said the skills that were assigned before spring break about mm, 3,000 times. Girl, bah. bah, get out, get out, get out. Or at least it feels that way. So if you don't recall what those are, go ahead and check the IXL task list on Canvas because I'm so tired of saying those skills. For this week's assignment, your required skill is C3. Remember that if you are working at a level I or level J, your corresponding skill is C1. But for sixth grade, level H, it is C3. Your optional extra credit is E2. So just continue to plug away at those throughout the course of the week. Again, please continue to read every day. I'm getting close to being finished with my book, which is an accomplishment because it's 747 pages long. <laughs> but as you're reading, remember that you do have a yellow reading log due to me on Friday, April 10th. Late penalties won't start being assigned until Monday, April 13th. Again, if you chose to do that digitally, remember to make a copy. And then that is what you can submit to me on Canvas. If you did your work on the actual paper, you can scan or take pictures and submit that on Canvas as well. And that's it for me today, ladies and gentlemen. I love you. I miss you so much. So much. So much. And you stay classy, Falcons. I'll see you tomorrow.